History is full of amazing stories and memorable people. But we don't care about them. No hits, deep tracks only. Some of the most influential people in the world have been completely overlooked or just plain forgotten. We are digging deep into the history books to bring you their stories. And maybe some laughs along the way. This is History's B-Side. Today's B-Sider is the Maverick of American Civil Rights. So given, as many of our listeners might know from our past discussions, the fact that you and I met because of our interest in music classes and both of our identities as musicians and our interest in music, I felt like today's episode would be best started off by discussing, you know, kind of a comparable character in the music world. So I guess my first question to start off the discussion is, do you know who Max Martin is? Well, I want to start out by saying that I am a, not a musician. I think I you was forced in into playing an Come instrument. On. I am oh not God. the musician right. that you were. I played some mediocre trombone because my parents said I had to play an instrument. You were like, weren't you like first chair, second chair? I was second chair to the best trombone player in the state of Ohio. Okay. Period. Anybody who is second chair in a 250 person band can call themselves a musician. You are not somebody who was made to play the trombone. I know uh, people I who mean... are made to play their instruments. They could barely <laughs> play them. I had people ask me when I was section leader, I had people go, hey, can we just march and not play? <laughs> well, you played the saxophone. Nobody could hear you on a marching band field. Marching band field. Oh my goodness gracious. I actually played football and I called it a marching band field. I'm so happy That's that so happened. embarrassing. I'm up later. <laughs> I mean, at Boardman, it kind of was the marching band field, right? Like, they yeah. just played football before and after the halftime <laughs> show. We just lost all our listeners that played football at our high school. I don't know how many Do of those there are. we have any listeners but... <laughs> that played football at our high school? <laughs> anyway, to answer your question, no. I, I don't know who the person you asked about was that was like two minutes Max ago. Max Martin. So... I came across this guy a couple years ago just in researching certain musicians and he kind of blew my mind in how deep his influence goes. So Max Martin is a Swedish songwriter. He's not a singer. He's not a pop star. He's not a rapper, but he shows up in dozens and dozens of top hits. For instance, he got his rise working with Britney Spears, NSYNC, and the Backstreet Boys. I want it that way. Max Martin, uh, baby, one more time, Max Martin. Wow. So, and, and he continued this. He worked, I mean, he works with Ariana Grande. He works with Katy Perry, Taylor Swift, wow. Adele, Ed Sheeran, Bon Jovi, Maroon 5. So there's dozens, t Justin Timberlake, there's dozens and dozens of top hits that you've heard that you think, oh, wow, Justin Timberlake song. It's great. Max Martin either wrote or helped to write it. Wow. And I mean, he's a super successful guy and I almost am envious because one of the things that always kind of turned me off about the music industry was the whole fame thing. Like, I guess, I mean, a lot of people do it for the fame, but it kind of seems like more of a problem than a good thing. Like you almost can't live a normal life when you're famous. And this, I mean, <laughs> this guy is worth $350 million. And at this point, once he charges about a hundred thousand dollars per song so wow. he he's probably richer than most of the people he writes songs with and never has to step foot on stage <laughs> now's a good time to tell our listeners that max martin wrote this episode we it's all scripted this is <laughs> we just are sitting here reading words that he wrote out for us you are my fire i was waiting how long it would take for you to sing on an episode me like I, feel, I sang, hummed a little bit of Hollow the Mountain King. Yeah, oh, last fair. episode, but you actually sang this time. I did. So, the reason I guess I bring this guy up is that he's completely unknown. Most people don't know his name. He hasn't. I mean, it took him. I think it took him until 2015, if not later, to even win a Grammy. Hmm. Um, if he's won one by now, I I couldn't find that information before we began, but. I mean, he's been behind all of these crazy top hits, and it almost makes me think of him as, like, some superhuman music god, because, like, how can one person write this many songs that end up 
being the most popular songs. It almost seems like he's, I don't know, in tune with what everybody wants to hear at the moment. Did you, like, give me the wrong episode title? Because this sounds like he should be one of our topics. And I mean, he <laughs> might. I, I, now that I've used, I'm using him as an intro, I feel like it would be an interesting topic, maybe for a later episode. That would be interesting. I think, I mean, a lot of our episodes have been about people in the past. I think our most recent person was Helga Meyer. Yeah. So it'd be kind of cool to, to do somebody from more modern times. Tune in in two weeks where Matt just found his next episode topic. <laughs> <laughs> probably gonna happen (laughs) so in in like i said it he's not a perfect metaphor for today's topic but the the reason i wanted to talk about this is because he's present in all of these major songs that we most people know most people know the artists most people can name the artists in the song but nobody really knows his name you kind of have to search for his name and i think it's not unfair to say that without him these songs wouldn't be the same if if having been written at all and that's kind of the effect that Polly murray had on a lot of the civil rights and feminist movements she's present throughout the middle of the century from the 1930s all the way through the 1980s and she has her foot in all of these different spheres of different fights for inequality but you don't really hear her name. Frankly, outside of researching for this episode, the only time I've heard her name was recently when I was watching a series on the 14th Amendment and they mentioned her name and then moved on. I mean, there was, it wasn't even like a discussion about her. I don't think I've ever heard this name until you picked it for your episode topic. And then I looked at it and said, yeah. I don't know who that is. I'll find out when we record this. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's kind of crazy, like given the amount of attention this past year and recently we've given to black inequality and the civil rights movement and how much I think everybody, at least in our generation is starting to learn that it took me this long to even hear her name. I'm kind of surprised by it. She doesn't flaunt her title. I mean, she doesn't go out of her way in her life to be the star of the show, uh, which I think is part of it. But there's some other reasons that we'll get into why I think she was kind of left out of a lot of history books. But before we get into some of that, I want to start with a bit of her background. Similar to C.J. Walker, <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> her early life was really rough. She was born in Baltimore, Maryland on November 10th, 1910. So this, to connect this to a previous episode, would have been about the time that C.J. Walker was starting to grow her business into an empire. She was the fourth child out of six to Agnes Fitzgerald and William Murray. Her parents were both mixed race, but they considered themselves black. Hmm. She had family members that were living in white communities being viewed as white, but her family wasn't that part of the family. So that's kind of interesting. I mean, I've, I guess a lot of the, the racial perception really depends on where you live and where you come up from. I think I was listening to like an NPR podcast or something that was about people that are viewed as one race, depending on where they grew up, even though they were born, some are totally different. Like the, the one story that comes to mind was this woman who was from somewhere in Latin America, or I I think she was from South America somewhere. And it was mostly a, I guess, white community that she was born in. But she grew up Mm -hmm. somewhere in, like, Brooklyn or something in America. And because she wasn't white, white, she was more dark-skinned than the white people in her class, they viewed her as maybe not black, but definitely not white. It's like they they were having... She was a kid and having a class about race and the way people are viewed. And the teacher, I don't know why, said, raise your hand if you identify as white. And she raised her hand and the other kids were like, you're not white because that's how kids are. So, I mean, it's just right. like, obviously that's not the same time period and everything, but like, it is interesting how race is almost a perception in some situations. Well, yeah. And it, among dozens and dozens of other things is evidence that, I mean, the entire idea of race and racism and better or worse is, I mean, complete utter nonsense just used to oppress people because when the lines are blurred nobody knows so where is the line like 
Yeah. You know? Well, we even talked about it on the uh, the first African-American Major League Baseball player episode that there was, though I can't remember his name now that we're recording this, but the, there was one player that played in a single game before Fleet Walker did. And he was mixed race, but he lived his whole life as a white man because he was raised as the son of his plantation owner, his plantation owner, a white man. So even though he might have had some black heritage or some black, I don't know, genetics, his, yeah. his mother was black, he was a white man and was treated as such. So it really just depends right. on where you come from, I guess, and how you, the community that you're in and how you're perceived and the people you're around. Yeah. And I do wonder, like, I mean, this is pure speculation on my part. There's no research behind what I'm about to say, but I wonder how much of that is behind the opposition to mixed marriages. You know, like if there's clean lines of division, it's easier to oppress. But once you've got a mixed race child or a mixed race adult, like then you have this, at least as an oppress, like as an oppressor, you have this problem. Now you're like, mm-hmm. well, how you know how far does that reach anyway out from our tangent back to our topic (laughs) so she was born to agnes and william unfortunately she was pretty much orphaned at a young age her mother agnes died of uh, cerebral hemorrhage in 1914 so at the age of four for polly murray her father, who was a teacher in the Baltimore public school system, suffered greatly from depression. And his depression was worsened by the long-term effects of typhoid fever. And these effects include delirium and obtundation, which are essentially the loss of connection with reality hmm. and kind of a dulling of your perception, a dulling of your emotions, which for anybody who's familiar with depression would just obliterate i mean it would make it so much worse to have those things in the mix from a a side illness Hmm. and in addition to this survivors of typhoid fever are sometimes left with permanent neuropsychiatric complications so i mean he already had a mental illness and it was just made worse by this disease he was eventually confined to crownsville state hospital for the negro insane where not surprisingly if you know anything about any mental hospitals of this period he received no meaningful treatment i mean at this time mental hospitals were horrific they might as well have just put them in prison because the treatments were borderline torture at this time even breaking medicine techniques were to shock the brain or to surgically remove parts of the brain like they didn't really know what they were doing they didn't have enough research it's more like a human testing lab yeah so and, and I can only imagine that at this time, the fact that this was specifically for black people made it so much worse because they were over in the white mental yeah. hospital doing the same terrible stuff. Murray wanted and intended to try to get her father out of the state hospital. But unfortunately, before she had a chance to, he was brutally murdered by a white guard in 1923. I mean, why would a guard murder one of the people in this mental institution like is it a race thing or would it like self-defense or something like did he attack the guard i mean it's it's unclear there's not a lot of information about the specific event online however i would find it hard to believe that race played no part i mean like i said we're talking about a hospital for black people run by a white staff Mm. in 1923 and while there's no indication that he attacked the guard, he was killed by bludgeoning with a baseball bat. So it's not like, I mean, it wasn't Jeez. an accident. Yeah. You don't accidentally kill somebody he with a bat. fell into it. Like, right. <laughs> so I venture to guess that it had at least something to do with race. Yeah. So after the death of both of her parents, Murray went to live with her aunt, whom she was named after, Pauline Fitzgerald Dame and grandparents Robert George and Cornelia Smith Fitzgerald in Durham, North Carolina. After moving with her grandparents and her aunt, uh, she ends up graduating from Hillside High School in 1926. And after this, they move to New York City and attend Hunter College, financing their education with various jobs and eventually graduating with a degree in English literature in 1933. Now, for our astute listeners who are paying close attention to my words, you might have heard me code switch to using the pronoun they. And I did that for a specific reason. A big part of Polly Murray's life 
was her struggle with her gender identity. She, at various points, struggled with her more masculine personality traits. It was unclear, based on a lot of her writings, whether or not she completely identified as male. I think it's safe to say she certainly identified with both sides. But it was hard to, it's hard to depict back when this was all going on. It was the 1930s. It's not like she was living in 2020 where, I mean, even now it's still a very difficult thing to do to come out as a transgender person. But in the 1930s, it was virtually impossible. It would have, in, in a lot of ways, made her life very difficult. So I even read, like, just in preparation for recording this, that just simple things like the word transgender didn't exist then. So for her to... yeah attempt to label her gender identity the i mean it was really male or female but if she didn't like you said if she felt more in touch with her masculine traits she had a hard time identifying as female i guess so like if if yeah there wasn't really like a clear cut anything for her right well and to to make i guess our intentions clear and and to make this episode less confusing because they can be kind of an ambiguous term when you're listening to a podcast. She used they and she, he pronouns for much of her youth and her college years. But once she started to work as a lawyer and as a civil rights leader, she almost exclusively used she. A lot of scholars posit that this was simply her putting this part of herself aside in lieu of other more important goals to her because like i said if she were to fight the gender fluidity fight at the same time as the civil rights fight and the feminist fight i think she would have gotten a lot less further than she did so for the purposes of this episode and this directly follows the Polly murray center's practice until we reach her professional career i'm going to use they and then we're going to switch to she so you're going to notice at some point in the episode i switched to she And just so you know, when I say they, I'm referring to her. There's no collective plural group of people that I'm I'm referring to. And I I did this because I wanted to follow her, the the Pauli Murray Center's example, um, to most closely honor her. That being said, nobody really knows what she truly wanted because, like I said, it was hard at the time. She didn't, she wasn't able and and wasn't made to feel safe enough, I think, to express it as clearly as maybe she, she could have now or wanted to at the time or there just wasn't a way to clearly express it right right that being said she did take some steps to kind of buck the system and this is the first time she kind of shows her distaste for injustice and and this individuality that is characteristic of her born pauline or born anna pauline she changes her name to a more gender neutral Polly, and this is kind of the first time she expresses any sort of masculinity in her personality one of the more telling expressions of this is a work that she created which was a photo album titled the life and times of Polly murray which included selfies quote unquote meant to depict different identities that she felt close to so was she the first uh instagram model influencer with taking her selfies i mean i guess i mean you could say that i mean we're not talking like she was holding the camera out in front of her face. These were essentially yeah, how photographic did, portraits. How did these cameras work? I mean, cameras are still fairly new technology at this time. Like, how would you go about taking a picture of yourself? I mean, I, I venture to guess she had either somebody take them or at the time technology was new enough that there was a time delay. Because the yeah, pictures that true. I did see, you can, you can look them up if you just Google the title, The Life and Times of Polly Murray. But they're, I mean, she's not holding the camera clearly and in some photos she has other people with her but the the interesting thing about this and kind of what i love about this project is that each photo has a title such as the priest the acrobat the crusader and many of these titles were meant to express her more masculine parts of her identity including the vagabond the dude mike and ike and tennis so she had all of these different uh, she she kind of creatively went about expressing her personality and all of these different identities, which is something I kind of love because I think 
a lot of us could identify with having very specific parts of our identity that we could almost separate out into a separate identity in and of itself. And then some of her more, I guess, social justice directed identities were the crusader, the priest, and my personal favorite, the imp, which is essentially a small mischievous character. And in the photo, she's kind of pictured looking back with this kind of wry smile as though she's proud of the trouble she's caused and is looking forward to tr causing more trouble in the future. Are some of these roles intended to be gendered though? Like there aren't, I would assume at this time, maybe Catholicism is probably the predominant religion. So priests are predominantly male. Like, sure. Is she intending all of these roles, priest, acrobat, crusader to all be male roles? I don't think so. I don't think she intended all of them to be male. I think, I mean, the dude is specifically meant to be her more masculine identity. And she does mention that the vagabond is supposed to represent her more, you know, risk-taking, brave side. That I mean, at the time, a woman wouldn't be a vagabond. A, wouldn't, a, wom a woman wouldn't travel like that. And so... I don't know that she would have agreed with assigning a gender to any of these, to be perfectly honest, hmm. but it was a way for her to, I mean, it was one of the ways she very specifically said, I'm not participating fully in this time's constraints on, on the feminine gender role. And another way she did this was she commonly wore pants. This wasn't a time where women <laughs> wore pants often. And she was sometimes vilified for that. She actually did pursue gender affirming treatments including hormone therapy uh but i mean like i said at the time these were so radical that she was denied several scholars having studied her personal journals and writings indicate that polly identified as a man and as a woman at different points in her life so definitely a, a big i mean i can't as a heterosexual cisgender male i can't identify with the struggle I can't imagine how difficult it is, but it definitely, I think her experiences there influenced a lot of her intolerance for injustice later in her life. You know, it was almost as though she's like, I'm black, I'm a woman, and I'm gender queer. I have to hide this one, and you're not going to make me feel bad for the other two. Yeah. So I, I guess this is not to, I guess, throw a wrench in it, but that statement alone is confusing to me now so i can't imagine at the time like you said if she were say i'm black i'm a woman and i'm gender queer like that almost yeah. seems contradictory so and that that's in 2021 times that i'm hearing this and we've like right. had so many conversations about what does gender mean gender identity and things like that so imagining this a hundred years earlier and trying to understand and for her to explain how she feels and for people in that time to be able to understand right. it and accept that I can see being a very confusing situation. Right. One, I mean, I guess to put a cap on it before we take a short break, I think a lot of people struggle with the entire concept. And I'm like, I said, I pointed out my identities. I don't think I'm the best to speak on it, but the way I try to best view it now is that all of it is a spectrum, whether you're talking about gender or sexuality, it's a spectrum. And the need for all of these different labels only exists because society needs a label for it. And so I think her saying, I'm black, I'm a woman, I'm genderqueer, like she has to say she's something at this time, especially like she had to identify as something. Um, just due to the time she lived in. Mm -hmm. but we're going to take a short break. And we'll get back kind of entering into her, the start of her career and her accomplishments. And we'll be right back. Matt, you like coffee, right? I love coffee. Would you ever want to buy me a coffee? Anytime, Phil. You just say the word. You know, our dedicated listeners could also buy me a coffee. Could they buy me a coffee as well? They could buy you a coffee. This sounds fantastic. We set up this service called Buy Me a Coffee. 
at buymeacoffee.com slash histories b-side and people can buy us a coffee yeah it's really just a way for people to support the show if they enjoy the show and if they're listening to the show we sure hope you enjoy it yeah otherwise you're just i mean wasting your time at buymeacoffee.com slash histories b-side there's three ways that our listeners can interact with the show number one you can just donate to the show by clicking buy them a coffee two you can join as a member for ten dollars a month or a hundred dollars a year being a member gains you some pretty cool perks you get access to our monthly bonus episode history's b-side battles access to our future episode queue a name shout out on a future episode we'll also send you a handwritten thank you postcard and sticker set and more perks will be announced as we continue on There's also some different extras that people can get on our Buy Me A Coffee website. Things like choosing the topic for a future episode. If there's a person, lesser known person in history that you have an interest in, let us know and we'll do an episode all about them. You can also buy sets of custom postcards, sticker sets, and future merchandise that we add on there as well. Or you can draft your own advertisement script and we will promote whatever you want in a segment like this. The website again is buymeacoffee.com slash histories b-side. Matt? Yeah? You owe me a coffee. Oh. Do I get a coffee too? You're buying. All right. All right, welcome back. So now we're going to jump into the beginning of Polly Murray's career. And I guess as a caveat before we move forward, she does so many things that A, we're not able to include every last accomplishment of hers, only for continuity and the time we have to to talk about her. So I definitely recommend if, if you're interested in the story we tell about her or interested in her at all, definitely research a lot of her writings and her accomplishments because they're so numerous that it was hard to cover in one episode. We had a hard time just picking an episode title for this one (laughs) just because there wasn't like one single thing to define her the way there are the rest of our people. (laughs) Yeah, she hustled like like nobody I've ever seen. Like if you pick any one of the titles we could give her, poet, priest, lawyer, professor, Saint. civil rights leader that would each one of those would take a normal person a, a lifetime to achieve so <laughs> the fact that she was just like slaughtering them all is is pretty badass but to kind of begin after she graduated during the 1930s she ended up working for the works project administration uh, which was a roosevelt era new deal program that basically helped to put people back to work And she also worked as a teacher for the New York City Remedial Reading Project. And it was during this time that she ended up publishing many of her articles and poems in political magazines, such as Common Sense, which was a monthly magazine published in the 1930s and 40s, and The Crisis, which was a magazine published by the NAACP at the same time. Hey, Matt. Yeah? It's 2021. What's a magazine? Oh, so it's like a blog but they write it in a book on pages, but it's like a thin book with big pages. What's a book? (laughs) Dear God. So this kind of launches her writing career. And like I said, a lot about her is prolific, but her writing career went on and on. She never stopped writing. And her writing is, is a lot of what made her so powerful and so influential And most of her writing had to do with racial inequality, gender Mm -hmm. inequality, and her experiences growing up. I mean, her her great-grandparents were slaves. She obviously faced discrimination as a young girl in her family. So she was kind of poised to be this force in intellectual thought around race. And so it makes sense that she quickly became involved with the civil rights movement. In 1938, upon being denied by the University of North Carolina, they began a campaign to enter graduate school there. Uh, It was an all-white school, and 
you know, this happened with the University of North Carolina and again later at Harvard, as we'll see. But she was a fervent opponent of these all white schools denying entrance to, to black applicants. Um, so she began the fight there. Despite lacking the support of the NAACP, Murray's own media campaign received national publicity, and through this campaign, they developed a lifelong friendship and correspondence with the First Lady, Eleanor Roosevelt. That's interesting. I mean, do you know how she met Eleanor Roosevelt? There's two stories about how they possibly met. I don't know which one happened first. The first is when she worked for the Works Project Administration. She ended up meeting her at a camp for women that was meant to... Hmm operate parallel to a similar work camp for men. But another story goes that Murray wrote President and First Lady Roosevelt to discuss racial discrimination in the South. Uh, and Eleanor ended up responding, which began a years-long correspondence. Uh, she also ended up occasionally meeting with the Roosevelts, <laughs> both at the White House and at their New York City apartment, to discuss her views wow. on racism, gender, the law, and inequality. So, No biggie, I mean, just going to hang out with the President and the First Lady. <laughs> yeah, I mean... Right, for the 1940s, 1930s and 40s, like she's meeting with the president. Kennedy wouldn't meet with Martin Luther King at first. <laughs> like, she was ahead of her time. It's also interesting because you'd think that, like, if you could get the president's ear, or at least the first lady's ear, any university would be thrilled to have you in their admissions yeah. office. Like, it, it's right. crazy that, I guess race or gender or whatever is a disqualifier from attending a university even when you're at that status well the, i mean the thing is at this point we're still in jim crow era south so it the university of north carolina doesn't surprise me um what later on surprises me that is that harvard doesn't accept her based on the fact that she's a woman i mean yeah we're talking about a woman who's met with presidents and is clearly a legal leader so i don't know <laughs> She does It doesn't sit well with her, but... Yeah. Murray ended up working to end segregation on public transport as a member of the Fellowship of Reconciliation, which was an interfaith peace and justice organization. In fact, in March of 1940, they were arrested and imprisoned for refusing to sit at the back of a bus in Richmond, Virginia. This was actually 15 years before Rosa Parks would perform a similar act of nonviolent protest. So why is Rosa Parks so much better remembered or more much more well known than Polly Murray if it's a similar situation it's largely a topic that you're probably familiar with which is marketing <laughs> um my guess is because a her gender fluidity and a lot of her views at the time were very controversial in fact there was another woman Claudette Colvin who did the same thing nine months before Parks Colvin was a teenager at the time, though, and the NAACP and other civil rights organizations felt that Rosa Parks was a better Ugh. face for the cause because she was an adult. Colvin at the time stated that Parks had the right hair, the right skin, and the right look. Jeez. She said her appearance was one that people associated with the middle class. So this, as wrong and as irritating as this seems today, a lot of the civil rights leaders and workers at the time were trying to figure out how to present things in a way that the white moderate would swallow. So, you know, it, that's kind of where my mind went when you said that. And I'm trying to decide if this is the right thought process, because it almost seems like the NAACP is guilty of the very thing they stand against where like colored people are being judged and held back because of essentially their appearance. But if they're picking Rosa Parks to be the face of their campaign, because she, has the better face for the cause and the right hair, the right skin, the right look. Like that seems like they're doing the same thing. But yeah. I do think there is something to who is the white middle class going to relate to that they will understand and appreciate our movement. I don't know that that's necessarily right. the right way to phrase it or to go about it. But I guess you need to reach people in a way that they're going to listen is, right. that, is that okay to say? <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's perfectly acceptable to say. I mean, it's it's very, it's a sticky topic, but there's two ways to go. I mean, I don't even want to say there's two ways. I'm sure there's a multitude of ways to go about it. But in the 60s, 50s and 60s, there were, I think, two primary ways. One was the 
I don't know, Frederick Douglass style, like we need to assimilate. We need to, you know, make this palatable for the white moderate because they're the ones who are the mass that vote. They're the ones who can help us change the laws. Um, if we're too offensive, they're going to join the segregationists, the racists, mm -hmm. the Jim Crow folks in the South, which I, I mean, I think is an absolutely sad situation. I strive every day to not be that white moderate today <laughs> who's so turned off by the more hard hitting radical views that I become the reason for that sort of approach. But that's also why you had the Black Panthers and Mar like that's why Malcolm X and Martin Luther King are kind of here and here, right? Like Martin Luther King was like nonviolence. We have to appeal to the white moderate. We need like, we can't be too intense about this. And Malcolm X was like, fuck them yeah i mean <laughs> we're gonna do our shit you like, did hear some of that we're gonna too, get ourselves out of just this. in this past year with all the black lives matter protests slash riots depending on what you want to call them because you have yeah. i mean you and i have both attended ones that were very peaceful supportive we need to be heard we need to be involved in politics to change things for the right way and to make things right for black people but also you know, it's the same argument that you don't notice these people unless they're causing a scene. So you could have right. all the same arguments about Colin Kaepernick. Well, he all he did was take a knee and everyone's up in arms about that. But then you're going to accuse people for doing something more drastic. Like, there's nothing violent or aggressive about taking a knee and doing something peaceful. But you're going to criticize that. Right. You're also going to criticize when people are rioting and destroying the city, which is fair. But what is there to do? You have to have both approaches. Otherwise you're not going to pay attention to one or criticize yeah. the other and just call them criminal. <laughs> well, not, I mean, that for me to take the entire conversation off of the, the African American reaction and the African American efforts and onto the white conversation. For me, the most frustrating thing is to talk to, you know, white peers of mine and kind of hear that attitude the attitude that they're almost looking at this as if it happened in a vacuum, right? As if a group of black people just woke up one day and decided to have a violent protest as though this hasn't been going on in a chain for dec I mean, not decades, centuries. Like, I mean, there's a really great, uh, that, that same documentary I was talking about, about the 14th amendment, they talk about how often the black population has been told to wait, wait, for your freedom mm -hmm. you have to do it carefully you have to do it this way and it's like how long would you be willing to wait for your freedom before you didn't so i mean it, we could go on for hours about this i'm sure but but we should get back to our topic <laughs> i mean yes and no i mean i think it's a good conversation to have but this is i mean back to that the topic this is why i think rosa parks was chosen um she was the more marketable, palatable, respectable person to have not followed the directions of the mm -hmm. bus driver. You know, Colvin was a teenager and Polly Murray was 15 years ahead of that time, which was probably even more unacceptable then and was also considered an intellectual troublemaker and possibly gender fluid. So, <laughs> I mean, she, she definitely wasn't in a position to be the NAACP's marketable quote unquote. Right subject i guess a few years after this in 1941 murray enrolled at howard university's law school where she intended to become a civil rights lawyer a year later she joined civil rights leaders george hauser james farmer and bayard rustin who does have his own episode forthcoming uh, to form the nonviolence focused congress of racial equality commonly known as core this organization would go on to organize the famous freedom rides through the south and also the March on Washington, where Martin Luther King Jr. would deliver his I Have a Dream speech. Mm. In 1943, Murray published several works, including two important essays on civil rights, Negroes Are Fed Up, In Common Sense, and an article on the Harlem Race Riots for the New York Call. They also wrote one of their most famous poems, Dark Testament, during that year. Uh, Dark Testament is a pretty long poem, but I kind of enjoyed the two first verses of it, and I want to read it here to give everyone an idea of her writing style and her topic style. Dark Testament begins, Freedom is a dream, haunting as amber wine. 
or worlds remembered out of time. Not Eden's gate, but freedom lures us down a trail of skulls, where men forever crush the dreamers, never the dream. I was an Israelite walking on sea bottom. I was a Negro slave following the North Star. I was an immigrant huddled in ship's belly. I was a Mormon searching for a temple. I was a refugee clogging roads to nowhere. Always the dream was the same. Always the dream was freedom. And so I think in just these two verses, you kind of see that she has a much broader view of oppression and the fight for justice and the fight for equality than even her identities cover, which I think is why she has such an intolerance for it. She really is just, she's against all forms of injustice and kind of makes that clear in her writing. I think it's interesting just, I mean, hearing this, the connection of the different oppressed minority groups, like I was an Israelite, I was a Negro slave, I was an immigrant, I was a Mormon, I was a refugee. Like all of these kind of are feeling the same sort of suffering and yeah, can connect and relate to each other. And they all have the same dream, which is freedom. And I think part of what's lost by the people who aren't feeling oppressed, I don't want to throw it all on white people, but that's typically what it is when we're talking about American history, is that if, if you've never felt that, you know, America's the freest country in the world, we love our freedom. If you've never felt like yeah, not free in America, then you don't really understand oppression. Absolutely. And I think that's what she means in the last line of the first verse. She says, where, where men forever crush the dreamers, never the dream. And for me, that line kind of paints this picture of like, you know, these same people who are standing there on the 4th of July singing the national anthem and so proud of their freedom and so proud of their free country that fights the world wars and wins for freedom are still crushing people dreaming of that freedom. Like hmm. they'll never crush the, they'll never admit, they'll never say, our freedom isn't truly for all. <laughs> Those same people would never say that. Those same people would never say freedom isn't a right in the United States. You have to fight for it depending on what group you're a part of. And I think that is the powerful part of at least these lines for me. Yeah. And clearly a, a theme within her that kind of pushes her and motivates her. That was cool. I'm glad you included the poem in this. Yeah, I was happy to find it. I There's actually, it's published as part of a group of poems, which I kind of want to get now that I've read some of her, her work. Um, but it's Dark Testament and other works. But it's not published anywhere online. I actually got this from a transcript of her. I don't know if it was her, but it was a transcript of an audio recording. Find your local black-owned bookstore. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we should, what was it, Elizabeth's. We should look up Elizabeth's and see if she has it. So a year later, in 1944, Polly graduated at the top of their law school class at Howard University. And it was here that they became acutely aware of the oppression women faced, where she coined the term Jane Crow. So Jane Crow kind of implies specifically black women. Like, obviously, the pun on Jim Crow. It, was that mm -hmm. sort of her focus? Or, like, she's talking about just oppression black women faced or is she fighting for overall female equality uh, the best answer is probably both she was one of the first she wasn't the first to coin the term intersectionality but she was one of the first to argue for it and for those who aren't familiar with the term it's essentially a joining together of different marginalized groups and a good example of this is like what we talked about in the poem <laughs> all the different marginalized groups yeah yeah, so, I mean, if you're a part of multiple marginalized groups, things get infinitely harder. And the best example, at least in terms of this episode, is when the civil rights groups began to get liberties and, and pass legislation for the equality of black people. And the feminist organizations began to gain equality for women. People began looking at businesses you know, schools and saying like, well, are you being racist? No, well, we've, we've admitted black students. Or are you being sexist? No, no, we've admitted women. They didn't have to admit black women to do that. 
they could have white women and black men and say yes to both of those questions. Mm -hmm. And black women were kind of left out in the cold because they technically weren't discriminating on race. They had black men. They technically weren't discriminating on sex. They had white women, but like black women were left out of that because, mm. you know, they were still the one group that technically didn't need to be included to make it look like you were following the law. And that is where this idea of intersectionality comes in. And I'll discuss that a little bit later when we talk about the National Organization for Women. But back to her struggle with this Jane Crow idea. So there's this fellowship called the Rosenwald Fellowship that was awarded to the valedictorian at Howard. And many previous top graduates used it to attend Harvard University. Despite winning the fellowship, Murray was rejected from Harvard Law due to her gender. She kind of has the same fight with Harvard that she did with the University of North Carolina, but this time about her gender. You know, they were admitting other people with the same fellowship, but despite the fact that she was her school's valedictorian, clearly capable, meeting with presidents, what else do you need? Like, <laughs> Instead, she ends up going to the University of California, Bull School of Law, where she receives a Master of Laws degree, her thesis titled The Right to Equal Opportunity in Employment. <laughs> After graduation... Polly returned to New York City to support the growing civil rights movement. So she's back in the civil rights game. <laughs> in 1951, she publishes her book, State's Laws on Race and Color. Uh, and this is one of the accomplishments I, I kind of want to focus on. So I bought this book, intending to use it to prepare for this episode. That was a poor choice. I'm glad I bought it because <laughs> it's interesting. But it's literally just a compendium of the the lower 48 states and tw I think 27 different cities ordinances and laws regarding race specifically ordinances that support segregation and diminish the equality of black people so she makes this entire encyclopedia of different laws against black equality did you read it cover to cover no <laughs> no nope. could you not at all. It's big. It's a lot. I opened it expecting like, I don't know what I expected. I expected a like partial biography, I guess, and then mostly essay type. People are going to think we don't fully prepare for our episodes. I mean, it's literally just legal doctrine. It even includes precedent and like court <laughs> decisions. So she publishes this book and it becomes this huge influence on a lot of civil rights litigators. Uh, Thurgood Marshall then head of the NAACP legal department described it as the Bible for civil rights lawyers. Oh. And it was especially useful in the 1954 Brown versus board of education trial, which, like I said, we mentioned Max Martin earlier in the episode where he's involved in making these songs that we all know. I think most people who went to high school remember Brown versus board of education, yeah. even if you weren't paying attention. And I wasn't, <laughs> yeah, you know, the name Thurgood Marshall. So, you know, he used her words, her arguments, her ideas to win that case. In 1956, she published Proud Shoes, the story of an American family, a biography of how white supremacy and anti-blackness oppressed her grandparents. Um, and shortly after this book's release, she ends up being offered a job at a new law firm, Paul, Weiss, Rifkin, Wharton, and Garrison. It was here that Murray met her partner, the office manager at the law firm, Irene Barlow. This law firm, which, I mean, to just say it seems kind of inconsequential to most, which is now named Paul Weiss, is a, a huge international law firm now based in New York, but it employs over a thousand lawyers. Hmm. Some interesting fun facts pertinent to this episode and other episodes we've had. Uh, it assisted Thurgood Marshall in his effort to reverse the doctrine of separate but equal in Brown versus Board. So she ends up working for the law firm that helped him in that case. In reference to a past episode of ours, it issued the report on Deflate Gate in 2015. <laughs> like the Tom Brady Deflate Gate? <laughs> <laughs> this is just a fun tangent because I couldn't believe that it connected like that. Yeah, this so this huge law firm <laughs> issued the report on Deflate Gate. Can you and, imagine that being on your resume? <laughs> we litigated Brown versus Board of Education and Roger Goodell versus Tom Brady. <laughs> Well, can you imagine being like a first year law associate and just 
interviewing dozens of NFL players. I don't know who they interviewed. Dozens of NFL players, refs, I don't know. And <laughs> that was your first case about a deflated football. <laughs> Do these balls feel a little soft to you? I went to law school to make change. <laughs> Your mom calls you. What are you working on today, sweetie? Flated footballs in the NFL. No, because it's some law student who's been like huddled in the books for the last, what, three years, probably longer <laughs> yeah. with all their education. And they said, you're going to go interview Tom Brady. And this nerd is like, who's Tom Brady? All right. <laughs> <laughs> for a more recent, not the two. 2015 is that far away, but for a more recent connection, Paul Weiss worked to find 400 parents who were separated from their families at the southern border of the U.S. as part of the ACLU lawsuit against the Trump administration over its family separation policy. So I mainly include this information to give people a little bit of context about this law firm, and it's a little more back to their roots than deflated footballs. (laughs) Yeah. A few years later, in 1960, Murray traveled to Ghana to explore their African cultural roots and to teach law. And during her stay, she ended up co-authoring a book titled The Constitution and Government of Ghana. Is this a book or did she write the Constitution for Ghana? It's a book about the Constitution. (laughs) She did not write Ghana's Constitution. It would be impressive. Another notable achievement. It would be. I mean, I would... I would fold. I would just give up on this episode. <laughs> like I can't, I'm not even... Today's B-Setter is the author of the Ghana Constitution. <laughs> among all the other stuff that nobody in their right minds would do in one lifetime. <laughs> Upon her return from Ghana, she enrolled at Yale University to study for the JSD degree, which is essentially the law equivalent of a PhD. So in case you were feeling disappointed in your lawyer son or your lawyer son who also got an LLM, which is a master's in law, she got... A JSD, which is a doctor of law. The first wasn't good enough, I guess. So, I mean, she's clearly, I mean, she's climbing all possible ladders to being at the top of her legal field. While at Yale, she ends up mentoring many young black women, many of whom ended up becoming civil rights leaders themselves. Anyone that we should know? Yeah, there's a, there's a couple of good examples. So the first is Marion Wright Edelman, who's the founder of the Children Defense Fund, which is an organization that advocates for disadvantaged American youth. Eleanor Holmes Norton was a civil rights activist and lawyer who worked for the ACLU and also specialized as a freedom of speech attorney. And she's also the D.C. delegate to Congress. So I learned something about our government. (laughs) I knew that D.C. didn't have like a congressman, but... D.C., along with four territories, and now I'm going to struggle to remember them, Guam, Mariana Islands, Virgin Islands. No, Puerto Rico has one, but it's not a delegate. That's terrible. I can't remember the fourth. So D.C. is the fifth, and Hmm. they all have, they don't have representatives, but they have these delegates. And these delegates can't vote on the House floor, but they can offer amendments, and they can also vote in committees. So it's kind of like a restricted representation (laughs) but she was a dc delegate to congress and then the final one is patricia roberts harris who was the first african-american woman to serve in a presidential cabinet under president jimmy carter as the secretary of housing and urban development and health and human services Hmm. she also priorly served as an ambassador for the johnson administration Hmm. And she was the first African-American woman to be an ambassador. Clearly powerful woman. She's like, I don't know. At this point, I'm just like, she's a Yoda of (laughs) civil rights people. (laughs) Of future black female civil rights leaders. Yeah. She ended up becoming the first African-American to be awarded a doctorate in law from Yale. First African-American, not like first African-American woman. First African-American. That's cool. Period. During this time, she was also appointed by President John F. Kennedy. This is now the second president interacting with her. And she's appointed to the Committee on Civil Rights and Political Rights as part of his Presidential Commission on the Status of Women. (laughs) That's a hilarious name for a committee. Let's let's check on the commission, the the Presidential Commission on the Status of Women. How are they doing? The women are pretty pissed off, John. (laughs) Their status is angry. (laughs) In a way that you don't want to know about. I think they just want some equal rights at this point. 
they'd like to be able to vote. Could they? I, I assume they could yes. vote at this point. That's a big assumption, but. <laughs> While working closely with civil rights leaders A. Philip Randolph, Bayard Rustin, and Martin Luther King Jr., she was critical of the domination of men in leadership positions of major civil rights organizations, writing, I've been increasingly perturbed over the blatant disparity between the major role which Negro women have played and are playing in the crucial grassroots levels of our struggle and the minor role of leadership they have been assigned in the national policymaking decisions. So... She was having none of this. She was like, men dominate the civil rights movement. It's not right. We need more women. Like, yeah. down at the lower levels, women are kind of running the show. And then there's no women at the top making decisions. Yeah. So she really, I mean, she was, and I mean this in the best of ways, she was a troublemaker in every room she walked into. Like, she she was having no part of any sort of inequality. And whether it was about race, gender, period, she was fighting for equality everywhere in her endeavors to fight for female equality she ended up being the co-founder of the national organization for women also abbreviated as now in 1966 but she ended up stepping away from her leading role believing that now did not appropriately address the issues of black and working class women which is where we get back to that intersectionality thing I was talking about. One of the c most common criticisms of now during its early years, and one of the reasons people point to it not being as effective as it could have been was that it ended up being an organization run by and almost intended for white women. <laughs> you know, it, it didn't do a great job of including black women in its struggle. And it lost a lot of support that way. But it also ended up contributing to that effect that i talked about earlier where black women ended up being left out of the yeah the fight the progress <clears throat> after this dr polly murray served as a faculty member at brandeis university from 1968 to 1973 where she taught early american studies it was here that murray met her partner the office manager at the law firm irene barlow Following the death of her partner, Irene, she left the tenured position to become a candidate for ordination at the General Theological Seminary. In 1977, she became the first African-American woman in the United States to become an Episcopal priest. I mean, she really is all over the place at this point. She was like the first African-American and African-American woman to do half the things, <laughs> which like great, good for her. But like, how do you, how? There's our episode title. The first African-American woman, fill in the blank. Yeah, I mean, I, it's so impressive that she just went from thing to thing and was just tearing down barriers. Not just not just succeeding in, in the sense that we would understand today, but like succeeding after tearing down barriers to entry. So I guess that kind of, I guess, brings us back to the gender identity point. Because we're talking about her being the first African-American woman to do this and the first African-American woman to do that. Mm -hmm. Did she, I guess, accept these glass ceiling breaking titles? Because if she didn't necessarily identify as a woman, would she have want to be known as the first African-American woman to do this or that? I don't know. I think so. I think for her, the her gender identity was a bit separate from her accomplishments as a woman. A, because she ended up pretty much solidly inhabiting her identity as a woman. I, I think, I mean, it, like I said, it's hard to say. Scholars don't even agree on it. They use several different pronouns for her. I think in like a perfect world, which in a perfect world, she wouldn't need to break glass ceilings, but in a perfect world for her, I think maybe she would have been breaking glass ceilings for gender fluid people, not necessarily women. Is it kind of just she recognizes the fact that she is born a woman and would, I guess, not prefer to use any pronoun if we were to label her? But the fact that we're doing a podcast and there's not really a good way to do that without saying... <laughs> who she is uh, like we're, we're the ones assigning the label i guess 
yeah i mean she did she did use he she did use she she used they she used all of those and in fact when she was arrested for refusing to give up her seat on the bus she gave the name oliver so like i said scholars note that at various points in time she identified with both she signed letters as a woman she signed letters as a man she signed letters as somewhere in between i think being a strategic mind she recognized that you know being sexually born a woman and given the fact that women were still fighting for basic rights it didn't make a lot of sense in terms of what she could accomplish to go with the fight from a gender fluid standpoint like if women are getting treated right in the work- workplace how are you going to run into the room as a woman to is transitioning to something else. I don't, I mean, whether you're going to go all the way to being a man or not. So it's maybe just us who are putting too much emphasis on trying to identify or define it. And even in doing so, we're kind of taking away from what she actually accomplished and what she actually did. Kind of that, that's how I assume her thought on it is, is that she's focused on civil rights Maybe. I think it's important that it's noted. I mean, I can't, I obviously we can't, and I can't speak to how she would interpret our conversation. I don't think that she should be remembered for having a confusing gender identity. I think her early efforts to express that, regardless of how permanent or successful they were, were really important because they were ahead of their time. And it was just one more way that she was willing to be an individualist, a rugged individualist who wanted to kind of knock down different barriers, whether intentional or not at the time. I don't know if you would know this, but maybe it's something you stumbled across in your research. Did, since she's at this point becoming an Episcopal priest, would they have had any religious objections to her gender identity? You know what? That's a question that I should, but I don't know the answer to. I mean, I would assume I, not if she became a Episcopal preacher. I well, guess yeah. I'm just not too familiar myself on Episcopalianism. That's not the right word. Yeah, I mean, at this time, in 1977, I don't know. I, in the, the very limited experience I have with Episcopal churches and Episcopal priests, the ones I've met don't have an issue with sexuality or gender identities but i don't know about 1977 but i imagine that you know being ordained unless at this point she had completely covered that up that she would have been allowed to be ordained so i venture to guess that they knew Hmm. eight years after being ordained as an episcopal priest Polly murray died of cancer in pittsburgh pennsylvania Her autobiography, Song in a Weary Throat, An American Pilgrimage, was published in 1987 and later that year re-released under the title Polly Murray, the Autobiography of a Black Activist, Feminist, Lawyer, Priest, and Poet, which you should all go buy. (laughs) We really need book advertisers. I keep keep selling books. I think her legacy is something to be noted... Uh, especially given that she's not commonly referenced in history books. She's kind of left out of a lot of references just because of her gender identity. And, you know, outside of that, her being a woman um, and her being black. But I think I love that photo album because it, it kind of was a representation of her whole life. I mean, she really was, she expressed the diversity in her identity that was present in that album. She was black, queer, female, a civil rights activist, an attorney, a feminist, a legal scholar, a priest, a leader, a professor, a writer, a poet, an organizer. So the, the, the number of accomplishments and labels she was able to hold is just dizzying. Hmm. And when I say like, I couldn't cover the information here, I really do mean it. Go research her because there's so much more. There's, I mean, it's an enormous amount of work that she did. Despite being disregarded and in some cases completely erased from many narratives of the civil rights and feminist movements, she was an icon whose ideas and writings were 
way ahead of her time, especially in challenging race and gender discrimination in legal, societal, academic, and religious circles. So it wasn't just the ideas that she had and the effect they had, but it was how early she had them. You know, a lot of her ideas would have been braved for the 1960s, and she was writing about them in the 30s and 40s. In addition to the the book I referenced, State's Laws on Race, um, which Thurgood Marshall used, she also created legal theories that Ruth Bader Ginsburg ended up using in another mm-hmm. important case, Reed versus Reed, which found that preference for males as a state administrators was unconstitutional in 1971. And this is one of the first cases that started to topple the inequality that women faced. So not only did Thurgood Marshall use her theories to topple racial problems, but Ruth Bader Ginsburg used them to topple gender problems. In fact, Ruth Bader Ginsburg included her as a co-author of her argument simply because of how extensive her influence was on it. And this is, I mean, this is another reason why I I wanted to use that example of Max Martin, because like, I feel like if you asked an average person, if they could name two, you know, civil rights minded Supreme Court justices, Thurgood Marshall and RBG would be two of the ones people would name. And like, she influenced both yeah. of them and they're and arguably their most important cases. Yeah. <laughs> most recently in 2012, the general convention of the Episcopal church voted her in as a saint of the church. Got to give her one last job. So yeah. One last one title last, to, to end our episode, to end our episode, we're going to tack on saint in doing the research, I was just kind of left in awe. It wasn't like the other episodes we've done where we researched a historical moment and somebody present. It was much more autobiographical, but in a way that was almost mind-blowing. Was mind-blowing. Yeah, clearly an, an impressive, accomplished person who, yeah, I don't know, in a way, maybe in her time wasn't behind the scenes, but nowadays we probably would view her as behind the scenes because... She mm-hmm. just influenced so many people. I mean, for you mentioned like the legal examples, but she was early in the civil rights movement ahead of people that we know, like Rosa Parks and Martin Luther yeah. King Jr. And just it, it's kind of amazing how broad her spectrum of reach was, like how, how many people she influenced yeah. across all these different fields and like you said, it's a lot of accomplishments for one lifetime to the point that we couldn't narrow it down to one sentence as to like who she was. Yeah, it was almost impossible to create a word or a sentence that enca- encapsulated it. And I think a good way to wrap it up, having just done CJ Walker um, two weeks ago, we, I mean, she was harder to understand and to research and to encapsulate in an hour and change than the first African-American female millionaire. Like she (laughs) outdid her in ways like in ways that made her infinitely harder to, to really truly cover. So, so she's involved in so many different things. You ready for your quiz? (laughs) I don't know about this, but yeah, let's do it. Oh, it'll be super easy. You'll, you get them all right. We'll see how it goes. We'll be right back. Science is the tool we can use to explain everything in our world. But sometimes the information's delivered in a way that's hard to understand, misleading, or fake. Join me at the Science Night Podcast as I talk with different scientists about their work. In a, a fun way. Find it wherever you get your podcasts or at SciNight.com. When we decided to make a podcast, the first thing we did was download Anchor. Because we have no money, and Anchor is free. You can also record and edit your podcast right from your phone or a computer. 
Then, it only takes one click to share your podcast to Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and more. And because we have no money, Anchor helps pair us with advertisers and lets our listeners support the History's B-Side podcast directly on our page. If you've got an idea for your own podcast, download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Welcome back to the episode. It's time for our quiz this week. We like to end every episode with just a short three-question quiz, kind of test out today's host to see how much he studied on his topic, and maybe you, the listener at home, has heard about this a little bit before, and you can answer some of these questions yourself. So just kind of give some background, see how much you know about the topic, and a fun way to wrap up the episode. You ready? Yes, I am. Are you nervous? You seem nervous. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'm not nervous. I, I'm just fairly sure I'm not going to do well on this. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't think... It's hard to gauge. I don't know what kind of questions you would have picked out. I don't think they're too out there, but it's not like a single topic, like questions about right. the Holocaust like we had last episode. Like, it, it's got to be about her or about... I don't know, something in the time period. So I don't think they're too difficult, but we'll see how it goes. We'll start simple for question number one. All right. Who did Polly Murray marry? I was really hoping that you wouldn't say oh. this because you left it out of your notes and I was nervous that you were going to oh say it. Oh my God. Who did Polly Murray marry? It, and it was a guy real early on, like... I want to say in her 20s. I don't know, like, this name is probably wrong, but I'm going to say William McDowell. You got the first name right. It's not McDowell. Okay. It's William. I just read it. Win. We went by Billy. Uh, Billy Wynn. They got married in secret I... on November 30th, 1930. So you were right. She was about 20 years old. But I found a quote from a historian named Rosalind Rosenberg who wrote, their honeymoon weekend spent in a, quote, cheap West Side hotel was a disaster, an experience that she later attributed Mother. to their youth and poverty. The truth was more complicated. As Polly explained in notes to herself a few years later, she had felt repelled by the act of sexual intercourse. Part of her had wanted to be, cut, part of her had wanted to be a normal woman, but another part resisted to it. So they were married for a few months before eventually splitting up. They never spoke or saw each other until Marie contacted Wynne to have the marriage annulled on March 26th, 1949. 18 and a half years they were Dang. married, but never really saw or spoke to each other. I can't believe I didn't mention that. How did I, how did I go over that? I mean, there was so much information. Yeah. But... I mean, really not an important part of her story, I guess, because it only really lasted yeah. a couple months and just never, uh, I guess officially ended it until much later i was i was worried you're gonna mention that <laughs> i'd have to find a new question i think i read over it and i almost added it in but i was just like there's so much here that i don't know how to be <laughs> outside of just casually randomly mentioning it and then moving on it didn't make sense to add yeah. in all right question number two what date is Polly murray honored on the episcopal calendar of the saints Oh no, I read this too. <laughs> shit. I mean, shoot. <laughs> For the kids. You already um, said the F word in this episode. <laughs> did I? I say that too much. I don't even notice when I say it. Um, I don't know. July 1st, which is actually the same date as Harriet Beecher Stowe, the famous abolitionist hmm. author of Uncle Tom's Cabin. She is also a saint. Uh, I would assume that Harriet Beecher, so Harriet Beecher Stowe is a saint in the Episcopal Church because she's recognized on the same date as the calendar of the saints. Gotcha. Okay. I didn't like really research that, but just making an assumption. And finally, you mentioned two former Supreme Court justices in this episode. Thurgood Marshall, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg. What presidents appointed those two Supreme Court justices? Oh, Bill Clinton appointed RBG. Yep. 
1993. Thurgood Marshall. Oh, if you need a hint, oh, this is terrible. you mentioned this president earlier in the episode. Oh, shoot. I want to say Kennedy. So close. It was not no. Kennedy, it's Johnson. It was Johnson. It was it Johnson? Dang it! I thought Kennedy was a little bit too early. Not too bad. I'll take it. I didn't do terrible. Yeah, you kind of got that last question. <laughs> I like half answered. You like, knew the question. answers to all of them. <laughs> you just didn't say it. Thanks for the the <laughs> cop out. <laughs> I got you. Partial credit. All right. As always, thank you guys so much for listening. Uh, we had fun recording this for you and, and discussing Polly Murray, and we hope you enjoy the episode. And we'll see you next week. History's B-Side is an independent, listener-supported podcast. Leave us a review or subscribe to the show on your favorite podcasting service. And follow along on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at History's B-Side. Send us your feedback or inquire about sponsorship and advertising opportunities by emailing us at historiesbside at gmail.com. You can donate to the show at buymeacoffee.com slash historiesbside. While you're there, check out our membership perks, merchandise, and more. This episode was researched and produced by your hosts, Matt Melito and Phil Hall. Thanks for listening to History's B-Side.